I wanted to be a doctor my whole life. I, I don't know why, I have no idea, but uh, that's when somebody asked me what I wanted to do at any point, I said I want to be a doctor. I was born at St. Angus Hospital and, uh, in 1933 and lived my childhood here in Fond du Lac. I had two sisters and a brother. My dad was a machinist and my mom was a stay-at-home mom at that time. Went to Mankato, Minnesota, uh, Bethany Lutheran College for two years in, in pre-med, and that's where I met my wife. And then um, I went to the University of Iowa for uh, one year of pre-med, and I managed to get uh, admitted to medical school in three years instead of four. When I um, went to medical school, um, I always sort of had in the back of my mind to go into psychiatry. I was in, at Bethany, uh, everybody called me Sigmund uh, because they knew of my interest in, um, in, in psychiatry. I was assigned uh, to Winnebago Mental Health Institute, which uh, uh, at that time I think had about 800 patients and maybe three psychiatrists, if that. And uh, I was given the responsibility of starting a children's unit. There were no children units around the country, and so I couldn't go look up, how do you run a children's unit? The giant of uh, in the field was Leo Kanner, Dr. Leo Kanner. Thinking of the thousands of kids that he had seen, he said, I'm thinking now of a particular group of kids that have these characteristics. They're withdrawn, they're kind of in a world of their own, there's very little eye contact, usually there, sometimes there's language, sometimes they're not, and uh, they're uh, uh, preoccupied with all kinds of uh, uh, trivial kinds of things uh, uh, and yet oblivious to the world around them. And he said, we're going to call that early infantile autism. And he coined that, that term. Child psychiatry, as, as part of my training, was in a, uh, it was in a house which was uh, separate from the, from the hospital itself. And it was my day to go over to start child psychiatry. And I walked by and I, at this house, and I just would go, just this thump, thump, thump. And I thought, my God, that's, that's unusual. And so I walked in, and here was a, about a 12 or 13 year old girl banging her head on the desk in the, to where the whole house would shake. And, and that same uh, feeling about this woman in my internship came to me and said, "Here's we don't understand what's going on here and, and we ought to understand it and maybe we can understand it better someday and maybe that's something we could, someday I might be able to dabble in and so that um, sparked my interest as well. It just occurred to me that looking at these 25 youngsters and, and thinking of this girl and this other, this woman, that that no matter how severely ill that person was, somewhere in that individual is what I call an island of intactness. Somewhere in that child is, no matter how severely ill, is this island of intactness. And our job is to search for that island of intactness and find it and then begin to slowly nourish it and encourage and, you know, bring that to the surface. What happened uh, on, on this unit of these 25 uh, kids, uh, three of them had some uh, special abilities which caught my eye. Uh, one one fellow had, uh, you know, at adolescent, he had memorized the bus system in the city of Milwaukee. And if you told him the time of day and the bus number, he would tell you what corner that bus is going by, and he had that all in, in his head. Uh, a second little guy um, uh, was mute, severely disabled, but if you put a 200-piece jigsaw puzzle in front of him on the table, picture side down, he would put it together just from the geometric shapes and just like the rhythm of a sewing machine putting that together. And a third little fellow was uh, an expert on what happened in this day in history. And every morning uh, I would come on the unit and he'd say, Dr. Trafford, you know what happened on this day in history? And I, I tried to bone up the night before, and of course that was before the internet. I had to go to the encyclopedia. That island of intactness in their case was an island of genius. And it just occurred to me that here, it was so striking to me that here's this jarring uh, 
difference between um, their uh, their ability and their disability, and and how can so much ability and so much disability exist in the same individual, and what does that say about potential within all of us? In June of 1980, Leslie Lemke came to um, Fond du Lac, Goodrich Little Theater, uh, to give a concert. I actually wasn't at the concert, but my daughter Joni was. And she came home and she said, Dad, Dad, she said, I just saw a miracle. And I said, what'd you see? She said, I saw this lad, he's blind, uh, he's cognitively disabled, he has um, cerebral palsy, which uh, he can't even feed himself, but when he's down the piano, it disappears and he plays a song. And he can play a song any, if he's heard it once. And she said, I said, well, honey, I said, that is a miracle, but it's something we call the Savant Syndrome. In uh, October of 1983, uh, 60 Minutes did a program called Genius that many people still remember that program. It featured three Savants, Leslie Lemke, Alonzo Clemens, the sculptor, and George Finn, who was a calendar calculator. Then the movie Rain Man came out, and that put it on the national and international scene of Savant Syndrome, or Autistic Savant at least became sort of household terms. So I joined the staff of St. Agnes Hospital uh, in 1962, and I'm still on the, on the staff, the honorary staff, so that's been an affiliation of some 40 years. This is sort of the most the last frontier. We, we know a lot about the kidney, and we know a lot about the heart, and we know a lot about the esophagus, but we really don't know very much about the brain. If I were to sort of distill down one or two things that, that I would tell parents of autistic kids, the, the first is the search for that island of intactness. No matter how disturbed that child is, or how withdrawn, or how uh, difficult, let, let's you know, look for that island of intactness and, and then we'll teach to that and, and from that we'll get better language, uh, more socialization and daily living skills. And the second uh, is uh, that love is a good therapist too. Those two things together I think are my recipe for dealing with autistic kids.